and all the while there's this octopus judging you. <laughs> Speak of the devil, Cassandra Clare. <laughs> it was one of those books where you close it and you're just like, damn it. Damn, I didn't want to leave. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to my first monthly reading wrap up of 2023. I am filming this on January 31st and if I seem distracted, it's because as you guys might know, I live in Korea and so today is January 31st, but for a lot of the world, it's still the 30th and so I haven't received my pre-order ebook of Cassandra Clare's Chain of Thorns and so it could drop at any time. Like I don't know when Kindle is gonna decide to upload it because for me technically it's the release date. Um, I had someone message me that they're in Australia and they already got it like five hours ago. So I'm waiting and I'm stressed. But let's dive into what I've actually finished reading this month. I read a ton. I also read a lot of shorter books. Like I mentioned for my December wrap-up, I'm trying to get back into branching out into other genres, reading a little bit more of literary fiction, maybe a memoir or two. So let's just dive in. It's gonna be, we're gonna jump around genres quite a bit. Starting with, I believe it's technically a memoir um, and it is called Thin Places. The reason I say it's technically a memoir, I don't know how to describe it. It was kind of difficult to read. I will admit to skimming a lot of it. It's about the author's life. She grew up in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. Her father was Protestant, her mother was Catholic. So not only was she dealing with the Troubles as a whole, but like specifically just in her home, um, they were ostracized from both of their families um, no matter where they moved their neighbors like if they moved to a more Catholic area if they moved to a more Protestant area their neighbors would shun them and eventually they would have to move again like it was just in terms of that part of the book was really fascinating so sad kind of never having a childhood always wanting to escape from Northern Ireland and then it takes a more like almost magical realism turn because then she starts talking about the kind of history of Ireland. She talks a lot about the Celts and the importance of the land and how just like the actual physical land itself is such an important thing. She starts learning Irish and realizes that because of colonization she lost so much um, and she doesn't even know what to call this lake um because the the english changed the name of the lake so she goes through this journey of learning irish and trying to kind of reclaim and and re-understand her history um it was really beautiful it had these really incredible passages it was just because it had so much going on and and it was kind of felt like a biography but then it felt again kind of like magical realism it was kind of a trip to read so I definitely did skim it but I think if especially if you're Irish I would give it a read especially when she talks about like relearning the Irish language um, getting back into her kind of Irishness that was stolen really incredible stuff um, I posted a couple quotes on my Instagram if you want to get a taste of the writing style yeah that was an interesting way to start off the year uh, thin places <laughs> after that after waiting for 10 weeks at my library to get this on hold. I finally read Legends and Lattes. I have been seeing this book everywhere and I was told that it was just a really cozy, feel-good, wonderful book and it was. Legends and Lattes is a hilarious book because you could take out every fantasy element. There's like one piece of the story that like the plot kind of hinges on one piece of magic but other than that everything else could be replaced with real life so there is no reason why our main character is an orc she could be a random per like human being like it it's so funny because everything in the book is so mundane and absolutely could have been real humans in like a non-fantasy setting but as for the plot we follow our main character who is an orc who has lived their life being an basically a assassin for hire she has saved up enough money she has done her one final thing and she's gonna retire she's gonna move to a new city and she's gonna open up 
a coffee shop. No one knows what coffee is because I think it's only like the dwarves that drink coffee. So like she went to a foreign land, found coffee and was like, I'm bringing it home. We literally just follow the first, I would say it's maybe a year, the first year of her moving to this new city, getting settled and opening a coffee shop. It's literally just comforting to read, not only because the story is charming, the characters are, are lovely, it sort of becomes this kind of found family feeling. There is like a crisis, there is actually like drama, but like as a whole it's just a comfort read because we literally just go day by day of her setting up the coffee shop. So it felt for me like we were just checking things off the list. There was something about the pacing and, and just the way that the actions went that was so calming. Every chapter she would add a new item to the menu and we would get, like we could see it was on the page, like the menu. I don't know, something about it was so adorable. So I would highly recommend if you are looking for, I'm actually working on a video for later this month about cozy one-shot standalone fantasies. Um, this is top of the list, Legends and Lattes. It was just a comfort read. If you love coffee, if you don't mind craving cinnamon buns throughout the entire book, um, highly recommend. Please read. <laughs> After that, really quickly, I reread This Is How You Lose the Time War. This was one of my favorite books from 2020. I read it in one sitting. It was incredible. And all of a sudden, like last month, all these people that I follow were rereading it or reading it for the first time and it made me want to pick up the book again so I actually ordered it myself a physical copy this time and I got it on my birthday so it was a birthday present to myself and once again reread it in one sitting it's very short it's very oh and they actually just translated it into Korean and Kurt was like hey that book you just bought it's getting great reviews in Korean so that's a cool weird thing that just happened last month. This is how you lose the time war is technically a enemies to lovers story told in two points of view where we have two different women from their agencies. There's the agency and there's the garden and basically these two forces time travel and change things that happen in history so that they can like win some future war kind of thing you know and it's it's really minute things like they might make one person miss the bus so they accidentally run into this other person and they go to a poetry reading and they hear a poem and it changes their lives and then they go off and become this incredible you know revolutionary or something so that whole aspect is really cool but it essentially becomes this kind of love story told mostly through letters it's told in a very non-traditional way i would say it's almost more of a poem um it's so poetic and so you are kind of just thrown into the world for me i thought that it made perfect sense but i know that some people are confused by it give it a go it's really beautiful i don't want to talk too much about it because i already have said so much in the past but um i it's still one of my favorite books. Um, a really quick read. This is how you lose the time war. Oh my gosh, next. Very highly anticipated. The Stolen Heir by Holly Black. So the Cruel Prince and I had our issues. The Cruel Prince and I have resolved our issues, okay? I didn't love The Cruel Prince at first. Now I really do. I still stand by not liking the first book of the series. The last two books were very good. The Stolen Heir is a continuation, a kind of spin-off. It follows a character that we meet in The Cruel Prince called Oak, um, who at the time was just a little kid. Fast forward now, he is a grown- I think he's like 17, 18 now. Once again, I thought The Stolen Heir was a standalone. It, well, it's not. Nope, it's, a, it's at least a duology. I, I don't trust authors anymore. They say duology, and I just don't believe them. So it's part of a, a multiple book thing, okay? The Stolen Heir, as I say, we follow Oak. We also follow another girl who is a changeling. And so she grew up thinking that she was just a normal human girl. She had a really nice, loving family, little sister. Then her evil fairy parents come back and are like, never mind, you're ours. And they take her and they are evil fairy parents. I totally forget the plot. I 100% forget the plot. Um, she ends up 
escaping in some way and she essentially just kind of lives in the woods um she spends her time trying to save humans from getting tricked by fairies and stuff like that she enjoys breaking curses but one day she gets caught and who does she get caught by oak who she has met we have also met her in the cruel prince um, I didn't even put this together until they literally said it in the book, but we've met all of these characters before. She knew Oak as a child briefly, um, and so they have this like weird past relationship. Regardless of their kind of not warm feelings towards each other, they are going to join together and try to take down the evil fairy queen once and for all. I would definitely say you have to read do you? I mean, if you really, for some reason, don't want to read The Cruel Prince, you can read The Stolen Heir without that background, but the world building might be a little bit difficult, but you could. But mainly, I did enjoy it. Holly, I said this about The Cruel Prince, though, is she's so good at writing fairy tales. Like, she knows fairy tales so well. So there were just so many details that were Oh, it just really I just felt so sucked into the world um, I will say that in terms of action it was very slow moving they were literally just kind of walking around the forest for most of the book but it did pick up near the end and hence it being at least a duology it was very exciting and then I assume it's gonna be even more exciting more action-packed in the second one, I feel like it might be a kind of Cruel Prince thing where the first book just kind of gets you into the world and with what's happening and then the rest of the series is gonna be a lot of action is what I'm hoping. I think that a lot of people can kind of relate, especially to the main female character. I do think a lot of people can relate to Oak too. I think that kind of the themes of wanting to belong, um, feeling like an outcast, I really enjoyed the messages that were coming through. Um, really glad that Holly's back to YA because they did not like her adult fantasy that came out last year, I guess. So thank you, Holly. Welcome back. There is like romance and I thought that it was really weird. I don't know. Let me know if I just kind of maybe was reading it wrong, but I thought that it kind of came out of nowhere and was a little weird considering how hard hitting the romance of the cruel prince is like even just like touching hands, you like feel it. I didn't feel that in this one, but let me know your thoughts. That is the stolen air after that i picked up lessons in chemistry this was i felt like a very quick read but i do think that i skimmed a little bit of the middle i will admit um it is about a oh god now i'm remembering it oh this was a sad book okay warning this was a sad book we follow a woman who was a chemist but now as we know it she is like this celebrity TV chef kind of seems like she's a Martha Stewart if Martha Stewart was like a scientist does that make sense she's very like matter of fact and this is what we're gonna do and da -da 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 -da. it follows her life um the things that happen in her life to get her to that point she's a single mother trying to raise a very precocious um very cute daughter with the help of this really wonderful woman who lives next door to her it's just a story about i guess the struggles and the joy maybe of not really of being a woman all of the characters are strong female characters in their own way like all the way from the daughter to this like grandma character it's in incredibly sad. We skip around the timeline quite a bit. It is sad. I think that it got a little slow in the middle bit. It's It talks about women in academia, women as single mothers, women who don't fit the mold basically of whatever time period they're living in. Not my absolute favorite, but um, it was an enjoyable read. There is a talking dog, sort of. So bonus points for that. <laughs> After that, I read Second Place. This is my first Rachel Cusk novel. Um, again, a very short read, a read that made me really stressed. This follows a woman who is at this weird point in her life where she's very comfortable, but she's very unhappy with that comfort. She has a daughter who has moved out, like grown up. Her husband is just kind of like this unchanging thing um and she's sort of going through this 
midlife crisis when she's in Paris she happens upon this art gallery and is really struck by the work of this artist so she emails him because they have this house I don't know where this is supposed to take place but they have this house in kind of this swamp bayou bog and they have like an extra house that they rent out to their artist friends and whatever and so the book basically follows her inviting him him eventually coming and nothing really working out the way that she wants it to. It made me so stressed because I saw so much of myself in her of, you know, having like so many expectations for things um, and wanting everything to be perfect. But then when like something doesn't go your way, you're a little bit disappointed. It was just, I don't know how to explain it, but I literally just felt anxious. I did read, after I finished it, I did read an article that said this entire scenario actually happened and it was kind of based off of another female artist's letters or journals about inviting blah 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 to come stay at her home, you know? Um, so the review that I read was basically like you get more out of it if you have, if you know the backstory and I didn't know the backstory. That being said, it was still a really interesting read, very visual. Even though I don't know technically where the bayou was, I could see the bayou. <laughs> so um, that was Second Place by Rachel Cuss. January feels so long because I genuinely can't believe that I read these this month. I reread Ninth House and I read for the first time Hellbent. So I read Ninth House when it came out before I even started booktube. That was my first Lee Bardugo. That was before I read Shadow and Bone. That was before I read Six of Crows, King of Scars, anything like that. This was a weird way to start. Um, Ninth House is confusing as hell. It is an adult fantasy. It takes place at Yale, which is where Lee Bardugo went to school, and it talks about Yale's secret societies. So a lot of older academic institutions will have these kind of clubs or secret societies um, and I believe she was actually a part of one in Yale so she's able to write this story with so much knowledge um, but we follow a girl named Alex who has started at Yale and she's on this kind of wink wink nudge nudge scholarship program which she got basically because she has an ability to see greys which are ghosts and so she is basically scouted by one of the secret societies to join them and like as a perk she gets to go to Yale full ride okay not too bad the thing that made this book so confusing and I think a lot of people didn't enjoy it because the timeline is whack it is oh my god like we basically know from the get-go that something happened to her mentor at Yale but we don't find out about that till like 75% of the way through. How do I even explain this? We just flash, we flash back, we flash even further back, we flash forward, we flash to present day but then it's not actually present. Like it's so wacky and I when I first read it I would have said messy. And I do still think it was messy, but upon the second read, it was so good. When you read it for the first time, it's really, really hard to get into. Like, understanding what the hell is happening is so difficult. Um, but reading it a second time, so good. Um, it took me a lot longer than, I think it's like 400 something pages. Normally I can read that in like two days. It took me a lot longer, but Hellbent, I think she got the memo in terms of what the hell is going on with the timeline, Lee? Um, so Hellbent is a lot less of that. There definitely still is, but it's a lot less. Um, Hellbent, we continue off of what happened in Ninth House. Um, there is a lot more action. It deals, both of these books deals a lot with various circles of hell and different realms, demons and necromancy and summoning spirits and all of the magic is very warped and twisted and dark this is an incredibly dark book i also want to give trigger warnings there is a lot of death there is a lot of substance abuse absolutely sexual assault and it's like on the page not just referenced it is on the page sexual assault um rape i mean it's very ugly um, Alex in her past has kind of worked with drug dealers and was in like really shady business and we read all of those details, all the horrible things that have to happen to her. So like 
I cannot stress enough that this is adult, very dark, um, but I thought Hellbent was so good. Like, whatever was wrong with Ninth House, she fixed it so good. I already want to reread it. When I finished it, I was upset that I left the world. I was upset that I read it as fast as I did. It was one of those books where you close it and you're just like, damn it. Damn. I didn't want to leave, you know? So that was Ninth House and Hellbent. Given how my first experience with Ninth House was, I wouldn't have expected to have loved this duology as much as I did. And I think it's gonna be a trilogy. See these, these authors, man. Liars. I'm I think there's gonna be a third book. It ends in a way where it could end. It's not a cliffhanger, but I'm pretty sure she's writing a third book. If you kind of liked Ninth House, if you were interested in like what was going on but you didn't really understand what was going on, give it another try and read Hellbent, please. Thank you. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, I was waiting for my camera to cool down. I was giving y'all a break, but my friend Kaylee just posted Hold on, she got hers, I better get mine. This is torture. I don't have it still. This is insanity. I'm gonna figure this out after I finish this video. <sighs> Next up, I read a very short book. It's called Ghost Music. And this, I mean, it took me like an hour or so to read it. Um, it follows a woman living in Beijing with her husband and her mother-in-law has to move in with them um, from the countryside because she's older and now she's a single and and her father-in-law had just passed away so and we kind of follow her life living with her mother-in-law who wants her to be the perfect wife and have lots of grandchildren her husband is very absent and doesn't want any kids she's also struggling with the fact that she was training to be a pianist her father was a trained concert pianist and she throughout her studies realized that she just didn't have that thing that like one spark you know that would make her this legendary performer so now she just teaches kids piano lessons and on top of that so she's feeling very stressed and very unhappy with her daily life and then she starts getting mysterious mushroom packages literally just packages of these like rare mushrooms to eat from a very mysterious person and we follow her on this kind of little portion of her life. I thought that it was really interesting. I thought that it was very kind of haunting, just very sad and I really enjoyed it. Like Lessons in Chemistry having a talking dog, there is a talking mushroom in this one. After that, I read Stories from the Tenants Downstairs. This is a collection of short stories. It's a debut. I haven't read a book like this before. It was so interesting. It all taught it all takes place in this one um, apartment complex that is feeling the pressures of gentrification. So people are being pushed out. Um, there are rent hikes, there are, you know, renovations, and so you have to be displaced, stuff like that. And we follow, I think it's like seven or eight different people. The author writes them in eight distinct voices like they're very different people and each one was like very eye-opening and very different i will say that some of them like i think the second story especially was like quite difficult to read because there is like the characters are not perfect they're just humans right we don't really have heroes or villains so there is like issues with homophobia for sure um racism sexism like just stuff that made me a little uncomfy but it i think was valuable to read it it also is written like i said with eight distinct voices it's also written very um i would say phonetically and i will also say that um the n-word is used a lot in this book so i just want to give that warning um it's uh, it's on the page a lot and so like i said i've never read a book quite like this i thought that the reading experience was really valuable and i can't believe that this is a debut like it was so well put together and each story was so interesting and distinct so definitely give it a try um it is the stories from the tenants downstairs after that i read the violin conspiracy this is a musical thriller it is about this man who growing up um, started playing the violin. He just has this like wonderful natural talent for it, but 
he's black and so no one would take him seriously like if he showed up to play at a wedding for a gig with his group people would be like oh you're the bus boy or like don't come in at all you know um even if he was wearing the suit holding his violin like he was dealing from from day one he's dealing with racism not only just in life but like specifically within the classical music community and he is playing on this violin that he inherited from his grandfather that he never met or his great-grandfather his great-grandfather that he never met who was enslaved and sort of the only thing after the emancipation proclamation he the only thing that he like walked out with was this like fiddle they keep calling it a fiddle and so he really cher cherishes this thing but our book starts much 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 later um where he is now a very established very well-loved violinist who is going to be competing in like the top competition for violinists in the world and all of a sudden his violin gets stolen and so then from there we flash back and we learn the whole history of his life and this violin and why this violin is so important and why people would be wanting to steal it from him and stuff like that loved it until the ending i thought the ending was so dumb but everything up until that point like literally if the book is 200 pages 180 of those were so interesting i loved reading about the music i loved reading about the history i thought it had really important insight on a world that i just don't know about which is the classical music world thought it was excellent just thought the ending was but you let me know what you think the violin conspiracy next up along the lines with legends and lattes i read another really cozy standalone fantasy and this is the very secret society of irregular witches again i was also waiting for this at the library for weeks and weeks and weeks. This is a very short little fantasy romance. It's about our main girl who is a witch and for some reason there's some kind of curse where all witches are orphans and so they're just like very lonely people. Um, they're also like discouraged from meeting other witches something about like magic kind of inspires more magic which just kind of invites trouble so if a lot of witches are together that's not good they can be found out they can be you know just basically you got to stay away from people you got to stay away from other witches and then you can't really be friends with normal people because once they find out you're a witch that's no good so they just lead these incredibly lonely lives and every once in a while like every three months they have this really quick meeting and thus they are the very secret society of irregular witches you get it you get it so she's just basically living this kind of sad lonely life with her dog until she gets an email asking if she would like to come tutor these three little girls who may or may not be witches and she's like how is that possible like witches aren't supposed to stick together how are these three little girls like who found them who put them together so out of curiosity she goes to this house where the children live and we follow her on that journey um the characters are so cute i thought the romance was a little bit weird there is smut and i will say it comes out of left field like it's it's weird it's sudden it's weird but it's only in like two little instances i can look over it because it was really cute it was this kind of like grumpy sunshine thing the children are adorable the other characters are so adorable it all comes together in the end feel good cute loved next up this was just a really great month for like continuations of things that i love so we had hellbent and then we had the mysteries of thorn manor i did reread sorcery of thorns but i'm not going to go into it because i've already talked about it so much and i feel like hopefully you guys know about it also please check down below um because i'm traveling the first week of february um the sorcery of thorns book club thing is kind of messed up so hopefully i think tomorrow or the next day we will be doing our live show but i will have that figured out by the time that i edit this so check the pinned comment if you're interested so yeah i reread sorcery of thorns totally forgot the whole plot <laughs> there were parts of this book that i read it and i was like what i did not like like big big plot points I did not remember so that was a fun reread but anyway mysteries of thorn manor is a novella so it was very quick um and it is just a little continuation of sorcery of thorns so that we kind of 
get to revisit the characters. I don't want to spoil anything, but it has a lot to do with the house and like literally the manor and there are all of these magical wards you know to protect the thorn family who live there um but they seem to be going a little haywire and so we're trying to figure out what is wrong with the house it seems to hold a few mysteries um and we're also just trying to recover from the changes from everything that happened in the first book. I thought it was so cute but there were also these just really sad moments like I sort of thought that this was going to be like a fluff piece but there actually was a lot of just really interesting like emotional work and I really enjoyed it. I would say if you haven't picked up Sorcery of Thorns yet and you still need to push if you love Will Herondale, if you love like those like Cassandra Clare-esque like very ridiculous quirky boys, I would say definitely like Will. Um, Nathaniel Thorne, especially in this novella, just has these like lines, like he's so funny and he's got such wit and I loved it. So um, there's your final put. I <laughs> Sometimes you can't help people who don't want to be helped, so I will not push you anymore, but read Sorcery of Thorns. Thanks. Speak of the devil, Cassandra Clare. <laughs> I did reread Chain of Gold, Chain of Iron so that I can hopefully get... Okay, wait, did my friend, did my friend answer? Because I messaged her. She's probably reading the book, so she can't answer me. <sighs> okay, so I'm preparing for the Chain of Thorns the finale of the Last Hours trilogy. This is part of Cassandra Clare's Shadowhunter world. If you don't know about it, the Shadowhunters are these people who are descended from angels and their main reason for living is to kill demons and keep the poor mortal mundanes safe. Us, okay? Chain of Gold, Iron, and Thorns takes place in London in kind of turn of the century, 1800s to 1900s, um, and we follow a group of the Shadowhunters. Unfortunately, if you want to start reading the Shadowhunter world, you cannot jump into this one because it absolutely spoils the Infernal Devices. So chronologically, you should read it Infernal Devices, Last Hours, Mortal Instruments, Dark Artifices. <laughs> there we go. Ooh. So the Last Hours will absolutely spoil Infernal Devices, which is most people's favorite of her work. So just saying, you should read that first. Um, but can't really spoil much. It's a lot of the same. There are demons, there are ghosts, there are family rivalries, there is so much yearning and so much romance, and I wish that they would just talk to each other. This didn't need to be a trilogy if we just talk to each other. I'm not going to go any more into it because I will be talking about Chain of Thorns in my February wrap-up, hopefully if I ever get my hands on it. Um, so that is just something that I've been living with. I've been trying to pace myself. I finished Chain of Iron last night, so hopefully the plot doesn't leak out of my brain because again, rereading those two books, it was like reading it for the first time. <laughs> so I'm um, trying to hold on to the plot so that I can read the next one. Okay. After that, I went back into my short book novella stage um, and I read a book, it's 96 pages. It was really short and it's called Astral Season, Beastly Season. It is by a Japanese author and it follows these two boys who are fans of this like underground Japanese idol who may or may not have committed a murder and because they love her so much they're like we're gonna take the blame she's been arrested and they're like well if we just kill someone while she's arrested they know that she's innocent so let's just kill like it's uh. so the it's told in two different points of view the first point of view was really difficult to read. I actually almost put it down because it is following the boys and their murder thing. Um, it's also interesting that even though they really idolize this person, they also really hate this person. It's very much like a male looking down at this stupid woman, but also loving her, like feeling that she owes them something. She should be so grateful for their love. And she's like so stupid. It was really difficult to read. Um, I don't like men talking about women like that in any way, shape or form. So that was difficult. But then I thought that the second 
part of the story was quite interesting. Weirdly for me though, my favorite part of the book was the author's note at the end, um, kind of explaining why he wrote this. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I recommend it. I recommend the author's note, which I posted on my Instagram, um, but yeah, if, I mean, it's 96 pages if you want to give it a try, but it is very dark, so. And then I read The Thief, which I think I was only let down by it because I misunderstood what it was going to be about. When I saw that it was a Japanese crime thriller, I thought of other Japanese crime thrillers that I had read before um, and really enjoyed so I thought it would be along those lines and this is really more kind of following the life of this one pickpocket um, who gets wrapped up in one job that he ends up not being able to escape from this kind of crime boss but it didn't really read I was thinking it was going to be more like a mystery kind of thriller um, but this is it wasn't um, I think that it did have interesting commentary on like classism I guess power and society as a whole so I did there was like a lot of value in, in reading it um, it just wasn't I went into it thinking that it was something else but this was a short read and I would recommend it um, quite dark quite gruesome like it is about Japanese crime bosses so so yeah interesting but just not not what I thought it was but a quick read the thief okay last three books. Thanks for sticking with me this long. Um, I finally read Remarkably Bright Creatures. This has been the month of books that I've been waiting for for a really long time at the library finally coming in. So Remarkably Bright Creatures, I forget who I heard about it from, um, but I went into it not knowing anything. I thought that it was very sweet. It takes place in this very small town in the Pacific Northwest where pretty much the only thing in the town is this aquarium and our book starts off from the point of view of the great pacific octopus that lives there um and he is sort of a present character throughout the whole book so our main characters in the book are basically this octopus um the kind of custodian who is this elderly woman who has lived in this town her whole life and then this other guy from California who is down on his luck looking for work and ends up taking her position temporarily when she like falls and hurts her knee. It is just a story about a small town. It's about loss and family and your purpose um, and all the while there's this octopus judging you. <laughs> I thought it was sweet. It's very sad. It does talk about like the loss of loved ones and I pretty much put all the mysteries together very quickly um, but it was just a really, like I said, a really sweet read and I recommend it. I can't really say anything more. It was, that was exactly what it was. So yeah, remarkably bright creatures, no fantasy other than the talking octopus. <laughs> After that, I am working on, for my Valentine's Day present to you, I'm making a video about your book boyfriends or girlfriends, and I knew pretty much all of them that you guys recommended, but the one that got a lot of votes, but I didn't know enough to judge fairly, um, was Ravi from Good Girl's Guide to Murder. So I read Good Girl's Guide to Murder. I would have loved this book if I was younger. If I read this in middle school or high school, I would have eaten this up. But something about it, I didn't, I didn't love it. We are basically following a girl who has decided her senior project is going to be looking at how the media played a part in this murder that happened in her town, but really, she's gonna solve the murder because she feels like the person that they accused is innocent and this happened five years ago and she's going to dig up all the old clues in this case and solve it. It was sort of a mix of mediums where you would have a novel but then you would also have these notes and like transcriptions and stuff like that so if you enjoy a book that has that sort of pace to it um, again, I really would have loved it in high school. It gave me similar feelings to when I read Harriet the Spy when I was little. I didn't really like Harriet. I didn't really like, um, is her name Pin? Pen? Anyway, our main girl 
didn't really like her, didn't really like how quickly she would jump to conclusions and accuse people and assume evil. It just kind of gave me the ick vibes that true crime currently does. Like I had a big true crime era, but now looking back it kind of gives me the ick, especially people who are just like hobbyists who try to solve these cold cases. So it gave me like similar feelings to that. But even that being said, like even with that slight ick, it was an interesting read. Like I, I didn't not like it. I just... I thought that I would like it so much more. Let me know if I should continue the series. I can't imagine how it continues, so please let me know. I wonder if the series gets better. That was a good girl's guide to murder. And then the very last book that I read, I finished it last night I believe, is Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. I saw a lot of people talking about this and I had no idea what it would be about and it ended up being another really cozy cute read. I'm glad that I read it. It is about a woman who is writing an encyclopedia of fairies. She, in this world, it's common knowledge that there are fairies. It takes place in the 1900s and in order to continue her research, her next place that she is going to be parking to do her field work is like way way up this like island somewhere off of Norway. Like way up there. We just follow her as she does this research. Obviously things go haywire. We get to meet her partner who is 1000% Howl. Um, oh my god, this was absolutely, if you love Howl's Moving Castle, these characters, it was Howl's Moving Castle if Sophie wasn't clean. <laughs> In terms of romance and smut, if you hate that, there was zero smut. There was romance. I thought that it was adorable. Again, I just thought that like especially the Howl character was so great. I really enjoyed it. Again, it was very fairy tale esque like how Holly Black actually writes fairies as they are versus, you know, the kind of Aquatar fairies who are just like strong and handsome, you know? I really liked it. It was written in sort of journal entry form but it eventually kind of flowed into just more of a sort of reading as if it were just a normal novel. It was cute guys, it was really cute. I really like thinking about it more, I like it even more as I'm reflecting on it um, and I it will continue but it ended in a way that it wasn't a cliffhanger so um, you can read it and be like me in a good place. <laughs> I'm not dying for the second book. So that was a really lovely way to end the month. Um, I'm losing my voice. Someone is starting to snow blow. Are you kidding me? Snow blowing what? There's no snow on the ground. Anyway, um, so I'm taking that as my cue to leave. Also, even if my book only comes um, when it hits midnight in the US, I've got two and a half hours so I'm going to buckle down and edit this and then hopefully I can just dive into reading Chain of Thorns. I can't wait. So um, as always, love you guys a lot. Thank you for allowing me to take a break last week. Um, I was in Japan. If you would like to see that video, I'll link it down below. It won't be out yet. So I will link my main channel down below. Yeah, I've got some videos I'm excited to um, film and share with you guys coming up this month. So all right, I gotta go. I gotta eat. I gotta edit. Um, and I gotta prepare my body and soul for Chain of Thorns. Okay, um, love you always. See you next time. Bye! <laughs>